And what's up, Facebook? Prophet David Taylor here for your weekly live prophetic word. <clears throat> uh, so much is going on. So much is going on. So much is going on in the world. Now, if you've watched my last two or three videos, uh, several weeks ago I had a back-to-back -back, uh, two video series called Answers, where we talk about answers, what's going on. What's going on last week, I talked about rebuilding. Okay? Uh, the prophetic word for this week is bad things, good people. Okay? Bad things, good people. Uh, so let's say a word of prayer. we we'll jump right in. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your prophetic word, your rhema word, your written word. And we thank you, Jesus, for being the living word. Please be in the midst of this broadcast, oh God. Then let the Holy Ghost breathe through me, speak to me, and let what is said be done to your honor and your glory only. That we may turn away from everything that is not pleasing to you and turn back to you with all our hearts and all our souls. And we thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, <clears throat> I've heard uh, a lot of people talk about, ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? If God is so good, why is this happening? I talked about a lot of that the last three weeks, but specifically we're going to zoom in today on that phrase, why do bad things happen to good people? Okay, again, if you want me to hear, hear me talk about judgment and larger issues of what are going on and what the church needs to do and all that, that's the last three weeks. Okay, but today we're going to talk about why do bad things happen to good people. And I stopped by to tell you the first thing that we need to establish is that there are no good people. There's no such thing as good people. That's something that the humans made up. So if you're talking about the standard of man, if you're talking about the standard of man, the standard of man is basically meaningless. And the reason that the standard of man, and when you come on the broadcast, please like and share. Please uh, share this broadcast, like it, and share it as many places as you can. Because when a prophetic word comes forth from God, we want to be sure it goes around the world. <clears throat> so, if you're talking about the standard of man, the standard of man is meaningless. Do you want to know why? It's meaningless because mankind changes its mind every five minutes. If you ask ten different people what they think it means to be a good person, you're going to get 10 different answers. If you ask people from 10 years ago, you would get different answers. If you ask people from the 20th century, anybody that was alive in the 70s or the 80s, if you ask people what they thought it meant to be a good person, they'd have a different answer. If you ask people from further back, from people that were alive back then that were around mid-century in the 1950s, they would have a different answer. Okay? The standard of man keeps changing, so it's meaningless because it keeps doing this. Okay? So, so what are people talking about when they mean, you know, I'm a good person, good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? So if you've been following me uh, in, uh, for any time at all, you know that I do a series called No More Genies. And No More Genies means we have to get away from our genie concept of God. We have to get away from our genie concept of God and actually go to the Word of God and see what the Bible actually says. When you are dealing with what I call the genie concept of God, you're dealing with mythology. You're dealing with Christian myth. Now, I know some people say all religion, all Christianity is myth. I'm not dealing with that right now. I'm talking about things that people say about God and people, things that people think about God and things that people that are, are, are assuming about God and they're not true because they're not in the Scripture. Okay, why do you think God gave us a Bible? Why would God take the time to, in all those years with all those different authors, to create Scripture? He created Scripture so we would know who He is, so we would know how He thinks, so we would know what His standards are, so we would know what His statutes and judgments are. That's why we have Scripture. And when you are not going by Scripture, you have a genie concept of God. You have a concept of God that you made up. For example, I've heard people say that they think that God is too good to send people to hell. I've heard some people say that there is no hell because God is so good. He can never create a place as terrible as hell. I stop by to tell you, none of that is in the scripture. God created hell, but he created hell for the devil and all the angels that followed the devil when he fell. He created earth for people. But then people started following the devil. 
And that's why some people go to hell. Because if you do what Lucifer did, you're going to get what Lucifer got. That's why some people go to hell. Why would Father send Jesus to die on the cross, to die a brutal death that nobody else could have done if he wanted you to go to hell? No, that was God reaching out his hand to all of mankind saying, I love you. I want you to be saved. But you have to repent of your sins. You have to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and have his shed blood wash your account. That's how you get right with God. And if you don't do that, that means that you're still in your sins. And that means when you stand before God in judgment, you stand before him in your sins. And if you are in your sins, you cannot enter into the gates of heaven. You follow the devil, so you've got to go where the devil going. That's not hard. It's just people don't like it. What people want to believe in a very desperate way is that you can do whatever you want to do in the name of love. And God will just say, that's okay because I love you. That also is myth. It doesn't make any sense. How do I know that's true? Because you don't even treat your children that way. I don't care how much you love your children. You can love your children with all your heart. If you've got a bunch of kids running around your house, you're going to have order in that house. So that house is going to be chaos from, from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night. You love your children, but you've got to discipline those children. You've got to chastise those children. You've got to teach those children order. Breakfast time, nap time, lunch time, school time, outside play time, time to go to bed. You've got to get order and structure, and you will chastise and discipline those children. You will not let children in your house run around and do eat all the sugar they want, break all of your lamps and your TV. You're going to let your kids do that because you, you love them? Because I love you, that's okay? See, that doesn't make any sense. And people know it doesn't make any sense. But they keep trying to create this picture of God that says that because God is love, that means that anything we do is okay. And that's not true. That's not even true for you. So how do you think it's true for the Most Holy One, for God Most High? That doesn't even make any sense. So I'm going to repeat my statement, and then I'm going to back it up with Scripture. Because uh, I do prophesying, but I also do prophetic teaching, and I also do exegetic teaching. In other words, we go to the Word, we see what the Word says, but we see what it says both in, in English, because that's my first language, but the Word's original language is uh, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. The Bible was written originally in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And so we have to look behind the English translations to see what was said in the original languages to get a fuller, broader picture. Okay, So I'm going to repeat my opening statement, and then I'm going to back it up with Scripture. The prophetic word for today is bad things, good people. Why do bad things happen to good people? And I stop by to tell you, there's no such thing as good people. It does not exist. Okay? And now I'm going to show you that in the scripture. Uh, I can't share my screen or else I would actually show you, but I'm going to read the scripture to you and you can look it up. If I had this hooked up differently, maybe I could share my screen and I'll work on that. Okay? We're going to go to Mark chapter 10, verse 18. We're going to go to Mark chapter 10, verse 18. We're going to start at verse 17. We're going to read 17 and 18. Mark chapter 10. Now, Mark is the second book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark. Okay? So if you have a Bible in the New Testament, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we're in the second of those, Mark. Mark chapter 10. We're going to start at verse 17. I'm reading out of the Berean Study Bible. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up and knelt before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus says this, Mark 10, 18, Why do you call me good? Jesus replied, No one is good except God alone. There it is. Out of Jesus' own mouth, he said, Nobody's good but God. Nobody's good but God. The Lord just told you that there are no good people. Well, more specifically, what do you mean by that, Prophet Taylor? All right. Romans 3.23. Romans, also in the New Testament, written by Apostle Paul. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the Bible said all. There's nothing on the other side of all. All is all. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are not on the level that we should be as humans, we fall short of what God had in mind. Now, I need to explain a couple of words to you. I need to explain sin, 
transgression and iniquity, because those are words in the scripture. Sin means to miss the mark. Sin means that the mark was here and you didn't make it. Sin means to make a mistake. Sin means to be less than what you should be. All of that is sin. That's why you can see that all of us have sinned. Transgression means where you knew where the line was and you crossed it anyway. So you live next door to a neighbor and there's a line between your yard and their yard and you go over there and you run over there in their yard anyway. Iniquity is where you knew where the line was, you crossed the line anyway, and then you tried to act like you didn't do anything wrong. That's iniquity. Okay? So one more time. Sin is when you miss the mark. Transgression is where you know where the line is, but you cross the line on purpose. Iniquity is where you know where the line is, you cross the line on purpose, and then you try to act like you didn't do anything wrong. Okay? So the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So it doesn't matter if your sin is sin, transgression, or iniquity, that's talking to you. Okay? That's talking to you. The way many times uh, people measure sin differently in different cultures. I have purposely worshipped with a bunch of different cultures, and I found out that each culture and each ethnic group has their own definition of the best thing in the world and the worst thing in the world, and this is the thing to do and this is the thing not to do. It's been amazing. It's been an amazing journey. And I found out that uh, Westerners, Amer Americans, tend to consider sin just based on sexuality and money. What people, The sins that people care about in America are sex and money. Okay? People care about who you're sleeping with, and people care about who you want to sleep with, and people care about money. And that's how people judge Christianity in America. But the Bible, God himself, had a lot more to say. Because God did say, thou shalt not commit adultery. But the first commandment of the ten that God gave Moses was, thou shalt have another gods before me. God cares about idolatry. And, and uh, the last commandment that God gave to Moses, the tenth one, was, thou shalt not covet. God cares about, a lot about if you're spending your days wishing you were somebody else, or wishing you had what somebody else had. Now, can you see, those are internal. They don't have nothing to do with sex, and they don't have nothing to do with money per se. That last one can have something to do with money, but God is looking at what you're doing in here. So that's what I mean when I say, when people keep saying, why do bad things happen to good people? Ain't no good people. You're trying to measure goodness by man's standard, which I said doesn't mean anything, which is why you need a Bible standard, what God says, and God talks about more than sex and money. God talks about respecting your parents. God talking about not working yourself to an early grave and resting one day and be sure that you honor a day of rest. God talks about, again, idolatry. God talks about graven images. The Ten Commandments was just on last night. And God talks about, don't you carve out nothing in three dimensions and say that's me. And don't you carve out anything in three dimensions and worship that. That is not me. God said, that is a dead idol. God said, you worship me. I'm the true and living God. So God, the scripture, has a lot to say. People. Uh, uh, try to reduce sin to skin color. People try to reduce sin to sex and money. Okay? But that ain't what the scripture says. So I'm going to say it one more time. Romans 3.23 For all, that means all of us, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means humanity is not what we're supposed to be. And we are in fact born in sin. We are born less than what we ought to be. Okay? So there are no good people. So if you're a believer in God, you need to say what the scripture says and stop perpetuating this Christian myth, this, this falsehood, this, these things that people say. Okay? Now let me show you another scripture. Okay? And if you haven't been grossed out and if I haven't made you mad, I'm about to gross you out and you're about to get mad because I'm about to tell you exactly what the Bible says. We're going to go to Isaiah 64, 6. Isaiah is an Old Testament major prophet. Now, remember I told you that uh, when you see, when you hear that phrase, major prophet, from the Old Testament, it just means that their books were longer. It does not mean that their message was more important. Because Zephaniah, Zechariah, Habakkuk, uh, Hosea, Joel, uh, those books are all small. And Malachi, those books are all small. There are four or five chapters. So we call those minor prophets, only minor in the sense that their books were smaller. Isaiah, Jeremiah, 
Uh, they have very, very long books, the longest books in the Bible, as a matter of fact. And Jeremiah has uh, Jeremiah and Lamentations. Ezekiel is very long. We call those major prophets only because their books were longer, not because their message was more important. So we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. Get ready to have your world rock if you ain't never read this scripture in the original language. This is a very familiar scripture that church people quote all the time. I'm going to read King, the King James Version. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness as our filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Now remember, I explained to you the difference between sin, transgression, and iniquity. I'm going to read that again. Let's read that again in the Berean Study Bible. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. We all wither like a leaf, and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. Okay? <clears throat> that phrase, filthy rags, that's translated filthy rags in English, that's not what it says in Hebrew. Do you know what it says in Hebrew? It says, your righteousness is like a menstruating woman's rags. God said that our righteousness is like a menstruating woman's rags. God said your righteousness is like used tampons. I'm just going to let that sink in. Every time you try to lift up something to God and say that you're righteousness, God said, that's like a used tampon. It's nasty. Your righteousness is filthy. You ain't righteous. Look that up in Hebrew and you'll see what I'm talking about. That's exactly what that says. It does not say filthy rags. It says a menstruating rag. A woman's monthly cycle rag. God said, that's what your righteousness is like. So this whole idea that there's such a thing as good people is not biblical. I have read you three scriptures. Jesus himself said, why do you call me good? None is good but God. In Romans it said, for all of us have sinned, and I explained to you, sin, transgression, and iniquity, and fallen short of the glory of God. Isaiah, Isaiah 64, 6 says that your righteousness is like menstruating, or menstruating woman's rags. When you try to lift up anything to God and call yourself righteous, God said, that's like a used tampon in my face. I don't care if you don't like it. That's what the scriptures say. So believers in God are supposed to be saying what the words say. Not Christian myth, not mythology, not what people think, nothing like that. Okay? There's no such thing as good people. Bad things happen to all people. Great and small. Do not we all have to go through the pains of death? Even if you live to be 105 years old, the day will come when you breathe your last. Now, I don't know if I told y'all this before, but uh, when my father died, I laid my head on his chest and I felt his blood stop running. They called me when my father died at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning on my birthday. I went to the hospital and I saw my father's body and he had just died. I laid my head on his chest to say my goodbyes to my father and I felt his warm body start to, to cool. Do not we all, at some point, have our spirit step out of this clay body and this clay body goes back to the dust? Then how can you say they're good people? When we all have to deal with the pains of death, we're all dealing with the pains of death now. If you're alive watching me now, and obviously if you're watching me, you're alive. If you're watching me right now, someone you know has died in the last two weeks, in the last month for sure, but in the last two weeks, somebody you know has left here, and it's been people great and small. It's been people young and old. It's been people from every skin color, every, every ethnic group, every kindred tongue, people and nation. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so how can you not see that we're all in the same boat, just like God said we are? There are no good people. Bad things happen to all people. So we as Christians need to say what the Word said, that there is no self-righteousness. There is no self-righteousness. There is nothing we could do to justify ourselves in the eyes of a holy God. That's the beauty of Jesus Christ. That's the beauty of the plan of salvation, that through the Lord Jesus Christ, they solve all the problems. Jesus was the Son of God, and he was born as a man, and he lived a life without sin. That's something only God could do. And then he paid 
for all sin on the cross as a sacrificial lamb because his blood was pure. That's something only God could do. Then he raised himself out the grave after three days. That's something only God could do. But he did it all also as a man to unite the two in himself. Jesus is the solution. His blood is what cleanses your sin and makes you justified in the eyes of Father God. And that's the only payment that God accepts is the blood of Jesus. That's the only thing that justifies you and makes you right in the eyes of God. Not anything you do. I just read you the scriptures where the Lord told you there's nothing you could do. That everything you do falls short. Okay? So stop talking about why do bad things happen to good people because there aren't any good people. Bad things happen to all people. We all have to deal with death. If you live long enough, you have to deal with aging or maybe aging in your parents. you got to deal. That happens to everybody. Okay? It's just that the same things don't happen to everybody in the same way at the same time. But that is neither here nor there. That don't have nothing to do with nothing. Everybody's not born at the same time. Everybody's not the oldest child or the middle child or the baby. Life happens. But there are no good people. And as believers, we need to stop saying that. And once you understand that, you will understand that why Jesus Christ is your only hope. You have no hope in this world but Christ. His name, his blood, his authority, his word. That's all you, you have. And what's been happening since the beer bug hit is that people have been realizing that. If you don't know the Lord now, you ain't got no way. There's nothing else you can turn to. Man don't have nothing for you. Ain't nothing left but faith in Christ. So there are no good people. Now, a better question would be, <clears throat> how did sin get in this world? Why is, why is there so much evil in the world? That's a better question. Not why do bad things happen to good people, because I've established there are no good people from the scripture. A better question is, why is there evil in the world in the first place? People ask that question a lot too. And I'm amazed how many believers don't seem to be able to ask that question. So I'm going to repeat that you need to move away from your genie concept of God and you need to know what the Word says because the Word explains everything. Okay? All right. Romans 8.22 uh, demonstrates what I just said. We know that the whole creation has been growing, to, groaning, excuse me, has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until the present time. Let me read that in the King James. That was a brilliant study Bible. In the King James it says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. What's that talking about? That's talking about the pain of sin's curse. The pain of sin's curse. Uh, 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 all kinds of cancer. Throat cancer. Ovarian cancer. Breast cancer. My mother died of breast cancer. Stomach cancer. Prostate cancer. Skin cancer. Uh, rape. Uh, uh, a divorce. Uh, a domestic violence. Racism. Slavery wars, chemical warfare, uh, oppression in your wages, working all day and not getting a full day's pay, on and on and on. Everything that you hate about living life comes from sin. It comes from sin. All those things are happening because sin is in the earth. So a better question would be, how did it get here? <laughs> Somebody said taxes. <laughs> so the better question would be, how did it get here? How did sin get in the earth? That's a better question. And here it is. <clears throat> if you read the account in Genesis, you need to read Genesis. I'm not going to read the first two chapters of Genesis, but you need to go to the very first book in the Bible called Genesis, which means beginnings. It can also mean origin. Okay? And you discover what happened when God made the heavens and the earth and how he made different things on a different day and how he made mankind humans on the sixth day and said we were made in his image. And then on the seventh day, he rested. Okay? That's actually uh, Sunday through Friday. And then on Saturday, where we understand the Saturday, God rested. So all that's in the first two chapters. I'm not going to read the first two chapters now, but that's what you need to read. I'm going to challenge you to tell me where is the sickness in the first two chapters of Genesis? Where's the AIDS? Where's the cancer? Where's the rheumatoid arthritis? Where, where's the cataracts? Where is it? Was that on Adam and Eve when God made them? I challenge you to find that for me in the first two chapters of the Bible. Where was it? Where was the racism? Where was the misogyny? Where was the misandry? Where was the domestic violence? Where was it? Where was it in the first two chapters of Genesis? Where was it? See, it's not because of God. 
God didn't give us the world in the state that it's in now. The reason that the world's in the state that it's in now is because of sin. Sin is what creates evil in our hearts where we hate our neighbor because they're a different skin color. Skin, sin is what makes us want to do like Cain did to Abel and rise up and murder our brother. Sin is what causes all these things. And I just read you in Romans 8.22 where the whole creation is groaning and travailing under the pain of sin. So a better question would be, how did this beautiful earth that God gave us dominion over get full of sin? And here's the answer. That answer <clears throat> is in Romans 5.12. Romans is in the New Testament. Romans is a Pauline epistle. He wrote it to the Christians in Rome. That's why it's called Romans. Okay, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. I'm going to read a couple different versions. Berean study Bible. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, so also death was passed on to all men, because all sinned. King James, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Okay? New Living Translation. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. And there is your answer. God told Adam in Genesis 2.17, not to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For he said, God said, for the day you, should, you eat thereof, in English, it says, thou shalt surely die. In Hebrew, it says something closer to dying, thou shalt die. So what God actually said to Adam that day was that you're going to create a cycle of death if you eat that fruit. Now, I've discovered that a lot of Christians don't understand <coughs> what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is and what it represents and why God put it there. Because the Bible says clearly that the Lord made the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to grow in the garden. That's in Genesis. What does it represent and why did God put it there? What the tree of knowledge of good and evil means and represents, it means it's an opportunity to separate from God and live on your own. When God created us, he created us in his image, which means we were full of the Holy Ghost. That means there was no difference between Jesus and us. You looked at Adam, you saw Jesus. You looked at Jesus, you saw Adam. And everything that we were perfectly reflected God. That's why we were innocent. That's why we were pure. That's why there was no murder, because we were one with God, the same way Jesus was when he was born into this earth. But what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil means, it's an opportunity to grow a conscience. God created us to be God conscious and not self-conscious, and that's why they were naked and not ashamed, because they were not self-conscious. They were God-conscious, and there was no impurity in God, and that's why Adam and Eve were naked and not ashamed, because there was no impurity in them. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil means that if you want to, you can separate from God and live on your own and live by your senses. So when Adam and Eve sinned and they ate that fruit, they disconnected from God, and all of a sudden, became self-conscious. All of a sudden, fear, shame, and guilt kicked in because they knew they was naked. And that's why we've been self-conscious ever since. That's why we're born in sin and self-consciousness. And that's why we're sight walkers. We think that what we see is right and that faith is crazy. And God says, y'all got that backwards. Faith is right and sight walking is crazy. So God gave mankind an opportunity to separate from him if we wanted to. And God warned Adam, I've given you all the fruit of the trees in the garden to eat. But if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die or you're going to create a cycle of death. So God was literally telling Adam, you can separate me from you want to, from me if you want to. You don't have to stay one with me. But the day you do that, you're going to die. You're going to create a cycle of death. You can't live apart from me. That's what God told Adam. And as we all know, Adam and Eve ate that fruit and separated from God, and they died, and that's when the death got into the earth. If they had eaten from the tree of life, which was also there, by the way, they would have been locked into eternal life, and we wouldn't be having this conversation. There would have been no need for Jesus to ever become a man, because they would have been locked into eternal life. Did you know that? If Adam and Eve had eaten from the tree of life while they were still innocent and pure, it would have locked them into that state. So then when they had kids, they had innocent and pure kids, and there would have never been any sin. 
That's how good a deal God gave us. So then the next question is, why would the Lord allow the tree to be in the garden in the first place? And the answer to that question is, is two things. is because God is love and because God is a just, holy judge. First thing, God is love. There is no love if there is no choice. There is no love if there is no freedom. If somebody doesn't have a choice to love you or not, then it is not love. Because love does not force. Okay? I say this about my children all the time. If you could line up all the children in the world and tell me I could be daddy to anybody I wanted to be daddy to, I would still pick the two children I have. I would still pick them. Because it's them that I love. If, I could, if God told me I could go back in time and have a choice to, to be father to anybody I wanted to be, I would still pick the children I have because it's them that I love. You understand? Because it's not a real love unless you have a choice. And if God had not given us any choice, the love would have never been real. You can't love God if you don't have an option not to. Okay? That's why the Lord gave us a choice. Because the love is not genuine. God wants us to love him from our hearts. God wants us to love him because we choose to. And you can't choose to love God if there's no other option. So God was so good, he gave us a beautiful planet. He gave us plenty of food. He put together the first family. And he told us to, to uh, have dominion, replenish, subdue the earth, okay? And he said, there's just one tree I don't want you to eat, because if you eat from the fruit of that tree, you're going to separate from me. You have the option to walk away, Adam, but if you do, you're going to die, and you're going to create a cycle of death. Because God didn't want Adam or nobody serving him because they have to. And if there's no real choice, you don't have an option. So from the beginning, God gave us an option to walk away from him if we wanted to. But if you do, you're going to die because life is only found in union with him. The second reason is because God is a holy, just judge, and God cannot righteously judge you if you don't have a choice. That would be unjust of God to judge you for what you've done, but you had no choice in doing it. So you have to have a choice. I know people don't like it. People don't like it. People think that God should have just created us in the garden and that was it. But the love would not have been real if Adam and Eve couldn't have walked away, if they didn't have a choice. And God's judgment is unjust if you can't help it because you don't have no choice. You see what I mean? That's why God gave us a choice to stay one with him or walk away from him. But he told, he warned us that if you separate, I've created you in my image and I've created you to be one with me, and you are full of my spirit, made in the image of my son. You look like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You look like us, Adam. But you can walk away from that if you want to, but the day you walk away from it, you're going to create a cycle of death. That's Genesis 2.17. Look it up. Okay? And so, uh, the devil talked to Eve. Eve bought what the devil was saying. The devil told Eve she could choose death and not get death. The devil told Eve she could choose death and not get consequences and Eve believed that that was a lie she ate first then she gave that fruit to her husband and then he ate and because he was the head because males because God put headship on the man when Adam ate then sin entered again Romans 5 12 wherefore as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned Sin is in this world because Adam ate that fruit. So I'm going to make this statement. If Adam and Eve liked the life that God gave them, they shouldn't have ate that fruit. God told them. But they did eat that fruit. So I know your next question because the next question is obvious and logical. You say, okay, Prophet Taylor, well, if we identify that sin is the problem, and we know that God is love and God is holy and just, and we know that God has all power, why doesn't God take his hand and just wipe sin out of the world and then all this goes away? Haven't you ever wondered that? Raise your hand if you ever wondered that. Haven't you ever wondered why doesn't God, since God identifies sin as the problem, why doesn't he just take it out? And the answer to that question is, is because he can't. Now, by can't, I don't mean does not have the power to. I mean that God is bound by his own word. <clears throat> the reason we have such a hard time with that is because that we can't relate to it because it's so different from the way we are.
because we break our word all the time. What's one of the number one ways you can see that we break our word? Divorce. You sit up there and in, in fancy clothes and you spend all that money and you sit up there in, in the Kirk County office or in a church or in a hall that you rented out and you said, I do, I will, I take. I take, I do, I will. I will, I do, I take. And then you got home and you said, after you said, I will, you got home and you said, I won't. After you said, I do, you got home and you said, I don't. Because we break our word all the time. So we have a hard time relating to the fact that what God says by definition is true. If it comes out of the mouth of God, it is by definition true. And what God says has to come to pass. That's the thing. If God had said to Adam, dying thou shalt die for 500 years, that means we would have had 500 years of sin and then we would have got a reset. If God said thou shalt surely die for 1,000 years, after 1,000 years of sin we would have got a reboot. But that's not what God said. God said you're going to create cycles of death. So that means since Adam ate the fruit, now cycles of death have to happen because the mouth of the Lord had spoken it. I know, I know that's news to a lot of believers. But as I've been saying all broadcast, as Christians, we are supposed to know the rightly divided word of truth so we understand what's going on so we can explain to people that don't. If Adam had not sinned, there would be no beer bug, there would be no cancer, there would be no any, any, anything that you hate. There wouldn't have been any of that if Adam hadn't eaten that fruit. But since Adam did eat that fruit, he let, <laughs> he let all of that in this planet. Because it was not on this planet when God made it and gave it to us. When God made this planet, he gave it, he said, let us make man in our image and let them have dominion. All of that was not on this planet when God gave it to us. It entered into this planet when Adam ate that fruit. Uh, Eve listened to the devil. Adam listened to Eve. Eve ate first, gave to her husband. Adam ate, and then they, their eyes were open because they separated from God. They, they broke off from the Holy Ghost, and now their spirit was dead, and now they were at the mercy of just their senses. And they immediately said, oh, Lord, I'm naked. Fear, shame, and guilt kicked in because they separated from God. And that's when it all happened, that day. So all this time, Christians and people in the world have been struggling with answers, trying to understand why all this stuff is happening. But it's in the scripture. And as believers in God, it is high time. Uh, I was talking about this with a couple of people. You do realize that God took his mighty hand and wiped out all that religious stuff we was doing, right? So now we have a chance to rebuild. That's what I talked about last week, rebuilding. And one of the things that we need to have as part of our theological understanding is that sin and curses and everything you hate about life is in this world because of what Adam did. It was not in the world when God first made the world. I've showed it to you in the scripture. So all the stuff we hate about living, bearing your parents, being hated because of racial hatred, rape, domestic violence, uh, uh, every kind of cancer that you know, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, cataracts, uh, uh, tragedies, like people dying in car accidents, or people burning up in house fires, or people drowning. None of that happened when God made the world. That is not the world God gave us. All of that happened because Adam ate that fruit, and he let it all in. Do you understand? So that's what I mean when I say, when you look at what's going on now, when you look at what's going on now, it's actually very complex and complicated. So I want you to watch my last three videos go back to where I started with Answers Part 1, Answers Part 2, and last week I talked about rebuilding. And today I'm talking about bad things and good people. But we need to have these answers as Christians because it's right there in the scripture. So to review uh, today's prophetic word, number one, there are no good people. You need to stop saying that. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Number two, the only answer is Jesus Christ. His shed blood, his name, and his authority. And number three, uh, all the things we hate about life happen the day Adam ate that fruit. I'm going to leave this with you, and then we're going to pray and close out. <clears throat> a lot of people misunderstand the purpose of the book of Job. Uh, the book of Job is, uh, uh, chronologically, they say it's the oldest book in the Bible. So it was the first book written, they say. They say. So that means that Job was written before Moses wrote. Genesis through Deuteronomy, they say. Job was uh, a man that feared God, and Job had a lot of money, a lot of cattle, a lot of sheep, 
A lot of kids, Job was big ball and shot calling. The Bible opens up a window and lets us see a conversation that God and the devil had about Job. And God was actually bragging on Job. And the devil said, yeah, yeah, he's all that because you got a hedge of protection around him. If you take that hedge down, I bet you I'll make him curse you to your face. Okay? And the hedge came down and the devil went after Job. And the devil kept attacking Job because God said, you can take everything but spare his life. So Job eventually got sick and he had boils. I don't know if you know what a boil is. A boil is a nasty, a putrid growth on your skin. And Job was covered with boils. That's his, the last thing that the devil did. Everything died except his wife. And everything that he had was taken away. And all my life I've heard people try to, try to make sense out of the book of Job because they don't understand the point of the book of Job. I'm going to tell you the point of the book of Job. The book of Job has 42 chapters, but it don't have but one point. And here it is. You can't stand against the devil in your own name. Everything that Job thought about himself was self-righteousness. When Job's friends came to ask him, why is all this happening? Job defended himself based on what he did and did not do. That's how you know he was self-righteous. Job said, but I don't do this. I don't cheat on my taxes and I don't cheat on my wife. And I don't mistreat my servants. And Job talked about what he did and what he didn't do. And as long as that's what he was talking about, he stayed sick. At the end of the book of Job, God comes down and gives Job a nature walk. And it looks kind of confusing. Why would God take Job on the nature walk? Because God was trying to explain to Job that God is the creator, that God is the righteous one. God is the one that understands how life works. Not you, Job. God is the one that's justified, not you, Job. And Job realized once he saw God that he was self-righteous. Job realized that he didn't know what he was talking about, and he realized what the scripture said about his righteousness being like filthy rags. And then Job walked out of the poverty of his name and walked into the wealth of God's name. And that's when God reversed his fortune. The Bible's trying to teach you that no matter how good you live, the devil's still going to accuse you. The devil's still going to have something bad to say about you if you live in as good as you know how. The Bible's trying to teach you that no matter how well you live, the devil's still coming after you. And the devil coming after you hard. And when the devil comes after you, you cannot stand on your own name. You got to stand on the name of Jesus. You got to stand on the word of God. There is no other answer. Okay? So how does that tie in with what I just talked? Because we don't have any righteousness of our own. Even the man that did everything he knew how to do in his day to the point that God in heaven was bragging on him to the devil. That still wasn't enough to stop the devil from accusing him and it wasn't enough to stop the devil from attacking him and beating him down to within an inch of his life. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of Christians I, I, I've come to understand don't know how to do like Jesus did in Matthew 4. That when the devil comes after you, you stand on the word. Every time uh, the devil attacked Jesus in Matthew 4, Jesus responded by saying, it is written. It is written. Then the third time he said, get behind me, Satan, for it is written. That's the only way you can stand against the devil. See, we don't have any righteousness. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. You can have morals, ethics, uh, religion, a whole bunch of things. None of that's going to help because we are not righteous in and of ourselves. We are only righteous in Christ, and you've got to stand on God's name, and you've got to stand on God's righteousness, and you've got to stand on God's word, and that's the only way you can defeat the devil. And that's why so many people now don't know what to do, because they're trying to stand against it. They're trying to stand all this stuff that's coming against them. They're trying to stand against it in their own name. You can't. You can only stand on Jesus the Christ and his shed blood and the authority that's in his name, because there are no good people. We have to be covered by his blood. We have to be covered by his name, and we have to use his authority. But the good news is, he's gracious. He granted us the power to use his name and use his authority and use his word against the devil. And that's the only way you overcome in this life. There is no other way. Okay? So I hope after this lesson, you, you realize, I hope the Spirit of God has come through this message and cut you to your heart, and you realize that you need to stop depending on your righteousness. Whatever it is you think that you got, it falls short. You need to let that go. And you need to get into the Word of God and learn the Scriptures. And you need to get into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can be intimate with Christ and know the voice of the Lord and do what the Lord is telling you to do. 
because only under his banner of protection and only through his word do we have any kind of defense. There is no, if people haven't figured that out by now, I don't know what else is, if you haven't figured out by now, after all that's happened in the last 30 days, that you ain't got nothing left but God. Everything else is torn down. Everything shut down and anything still running is overtaxed. The medical facilities, the medical personnel, the grocery stores, every, everything that's still running is past the breaking point and everything else shut down. All, everything, entire economies of nations are shut down and they can't figure out what to do because ain't nothing we can do outside of Christ. That's the message. That's the point. Okay? All right. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. Anything you want me to pray for, put it on the screen now. When you see me close my eyes, I'm praying in tongues. I'm asking the Holy Ghost, are there any more prophetic words, finances, deliverance, uh, general prophetic words, or physical healing? Okay? But if you have anything you want me to pray for, put it on the screen right now. Okay, all right, I'm going to show you what the Holy Ghost just showed me. The Holy Ghost just showed me a cauldron. Pray for a pop fan. Uh, all right, and right now in the name of Jesus, we're praying for son if you want, praying for your father, family, future, and faith, praying for your family, that God would visit your family and give you a revelation of him and increase your faith and set your feet on the right path and let everyone in your family know Jesus Christ and be born again, that you might walk uprightly through the power of his spirit and his grace and be pleasing in the sight of God our Father. In Jesus' name we declare and decree and believe it. Amen. The Holy Ghost shit just, just showed me a cauldron. He showed me that there's a bubbling cauldron coming. And then he said, fear not. For those of you that fear my name and stay with me, it will pass you by. So, don't know what that's going to look like in the days and weeks to come, but there's a bubbling cauldron coming. But the Lord said to those of us that are abiding in him, because uh, when I get up, I confess Psalm 91 every day. If you don't know Psalm 91, Psalm 91 is the scripture for this hour. For those of you that are not confessing Psalm 91 at least once a day, I'll read it, I'll confess it when I start my day in the morning. Go to Psalm chapter 91, read every verse of that psalm every morning before you start your day, because that's the scripture for this hour. But there's a bubbling cauldron coming. I don't know what that's going to look like, but the Holy Ghost said that's what's coming. But he said, don't be afraid, because those of us that fear his name is going to pass us by. The Ten Commandments was just on last night, the first Passover. Where does the first Passover come from? Do you know where, what Passover is? Passover is not Easter, by the way. Passover is something that the Hebrew people started, and Easter is celebrating Jesus' resurrection that Christians started. Passover and Easter are not the same thing, Okay. Uh, Ten Commandments is all last night. If you don't know what Passover is, when Moses was delivering the children of Israel, Israel from the bondage of Egypt, one of the plagues that God dropped on uh, the Egyptians was the death of the firstborn. God sent the angel of death in the TV show that comes down out of the sky like a green mist. And God uh, sent, amen, Erica, amen. And God sent death down as a green mist and said that all of the firstborn was going to die. God told the Israelites to take the blood of the lamb and put it on their uh, doorposts. And God said when the, the death mist, when the angel of death sees the blood on your doorpost, they're going to, it's going to pass over you. So that's why all the firstborn of the Egyptians died and all the firstborn of the Israelites did not. Because when they saw the blood, death passed them over. And that was a sign of Christ. That's what Passover means. That's where it comes from. It comes from Hebrew culture. When God saved the Hebrews from the death curse of the firstborn, but not the Egyptians, because the Hebrews took the blood of a lamb and put it on their doorposts. And that was a sign of how God was going to save humanity by covering us with the blood of Christ. So that's what I mean when I say these pictures and these themes in the Bible are consistent. God uses different circumstances and situations, but he's teaching us the same basic truth, that we got to be covered by his blood. And that's the only, only way we can be saved. Can you see that? That was just on TV last night. That's what I'm trying to tell you. 
So whatever this bulbing cauldron is, I don't know what that means. It could, it could mean a lot of things. It could be pus, could be boils, could be breakout, could be a next level beer bug. It could be a lot of things. It could be war, trouble. I don't know what it is, but it's a bulbing cauldron, and it's coming, because that's what I just saw in the spirit. But the Holy Ghost said, do not be afraid for those of us that trust in his name and fear him, because it's going to pass us by. Okay? My response to that is amen and amen. And I just want to remember I tell you every week that I'm not saying anything that I'm not doing myself. So I'm covering my family, me and mine, in the blood and in Psalm 91 every day. Okay, and I'm believing God every day. And in the natural, I have increased my intake of vitamin C uh, uh, so that your natural immune system can be boosted. And uh, so your body itself just pushes infection out of it when your immune system is high. So I'm doing things in the spiritual and I'm doing things in the natural because we also have to use wisdom. We're not supposed to tempt God and do foolish things and then demand that God save us. We've seen a lot of Christian people do that. You're supposed to use wisdom. You're not supposed to tempt God. And to tempt God means, that's from Matthew 4, when the devil told Jesus to climb the top of a mountain and jump off and then call on God to catch him. And Jesus says, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So in other words, God is saying, just because I give you angelic protection, Psalm 91, doesn't mean you should do foolish things like jump off a mountain and then demand that I catch you. So that means we, it, we shouldn't be doing foolish things in the natural just because we're claiming our promise of divine protection. We should use faith for the word of God and wisdom, some sense, <laughs> for our natural choices out here. That's what I myself am doing because I'm not on here saying stuff to you that I'm not doing myself. I'm covering myself, me and mine, my kids and my family in the blood every day. <laughs> okay? All right. <clears throat> amen, amen. So, let me see if there's anything else. The Holy Ghost is saying to me, to say to the children of God, don't be afraid, stay with me. Holy Ghost just gave me that prophetic word. Don't be afraid, stay with me. And if I could make you hear it, how he said it on the inside of my spirit, it was very loving. It was very, very much like an embrace. It was very warm. See, and that's the Jesus I know. That's the good shepherd right there. The good shepherd said, don't be afraid. Stay with me. Stay close to me. Stay in love with me. Stay full of my words. Stay full of my spirits. Keep your ear open to my voice. Okay? That's what the Holy Ghost just gave me. Don't be afraid. Stay with me. Stay with me. Those, those are the kinds of things you say to somebody that you love. Stay with me. Don't go. If you have children and, and your children don't live with you, every time they walk out the door, a part of your heart just breaks because you want to say, stay, stay with me. Okay? In times like this, if you're married, if your spouse has to go out to get groceries or whatever, when your spouse separates, you start praying and say, Lord, please bring them back to me. Stay, stay with me. Stay with me. Okay? That's what the Holy Ghost just gave me. See, that is the voice of an intimate lover. That's somebody that loves you and knows you and loves your soul. And that's what we need to be showing people as believers, that the love of the Good Shepherd is warm and intimate, and there's protection in his love, and there's power in his name, and there's cleansing power in his blood, and he loves us, he wants us to stay with him. So he said, don't be afraid. So no matter what happens the rest of today, and no matter what comes next in the world, the Lord has said, don't be afraid, just stay with me. Fine with me. I say, yeah and amen, fine with me. Okay? All right, amen, God bless you. Thank you to so much. Thank you so much to those of you that tuned in and watched me live on Facebook Live and Periscope. Um, I'm going to get this replay on YouTube. Uh, and thank you to, to, to those of you that are listening on the podcast. Amen, and God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm on every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time with a weekly live prophetic word. And then I come on the second Thursday of every month with a program called No More Genius, where we do everything we can to get rid of our genie concept of God and we look at what the Word actually says, a lot like we did today. We look at the, what the Scripture actually says so we can start saying what God says and get rid of everything that is unlike God. Okay? And man, God bless. Don't forget to like and share uh, this video And uh, because when the Word of God goes forth, God bless you too uh, on Periscope. Uh, Stun if you want. God bless you too. So whenever prophetic word goes forth, as many people as possible can see it. Um, I'm, I'm releasing all kinds of materials. My second quarter prophetic devotional is out. I've written a devotional where you can study a prophetic scripture every day to work on your closeness to God through the prophetic. 
I'm releasing music on New Music Friday. I just dropped a new hymn on Friday, the second hymn. I'm writing 150 hymns, a hymn for every song, because I don't just have the prophetic flow. I also have it in psalmist and minstrel flow, meaning I'm a songwriter and I'm a musician. So I'm releasing everything that God gave me. So check my page so you can and check my website, Prophet David Taylor, uh, prophetdavidtaylor.org, so you can uh, see all the things that I'm releasing, okay? Amen, and God bless you. Thank you so much. I'm honored. You hear me say it all the time. I'm honored for God to use me. It's an honor for God to use you in any kind of way because God don't need me. I'm just clay and breath. I'm just a man. I'm just a creature that he invented. He don't need me, but he's given me an opportunity to serve him, and I'm glad to take it, and I want to encourage you to serve God with your life because that's an opportunity to make your life count and not waste your days, okay? Amen, and God bless you. I'll see you this Thursday at 7 o'clock for No More Genies. And I'll see you next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. Amen and God bless.